In the holy name of Jesus, amen. A shroud of darkness engulfs us. Sin, death, and disease threaten to sever us from life's fullest measure. Without our new life in Christ Jesus, there would be no light to dis- dissipate, dispel, or curb the darkness of our grief and sadness. But Jesus has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light, delivering us from the dark domain. He has put his words into our mouths and covered us with the shadow of his hand. We are his people. And thus, in the presence of Christ, in word and water and bread and wine, it's Jesus who's confronting our sinful nature with the light of his forgiveness. It's in these sacraments that Christ claims us as his own, his own children, he alone creating and sustaining faith in us. And so, in Christ, we receive those same humble words that that little girl received. Your faith has saved you. And of course, on the last day, God will surely awaken us also from from slumber to his resurrection glory. But that's not how it always seems to us, is it? The darkness of this world surrounds us day to day. Of course, It's not just the world, but it's even the darkness of our own sinful heart. The corruption that we see creeping into every facet of our life, into our workplaces, into our homes, into our congregations, our church bodies. Corruption seeping, that creeping darkness into all manner of government and authority. Indeed, the whole world being shrouded in darkness. It could seem to be uh, a time of great doom and gloom, of sadness, of despair. But we're gathered here today in the light of Christ so that we don't become overwhelmed by that darkness. That Christ would shine his light into our hearts, dispelling the gloom and the sadness, enlightening us with the light of his forgiveness again and again. One of the reasons we think, I would say the chief reason we think, that the darkness can overwhelm us is that we fail to remember who Jesus is, and by extension then, who God the Holy Trinity is. Not just who he is in an abstract sense, but who he is as defined by what he has done. God wants to be known by us by what he has done for us. And so we could begin tonight with the gospel, and this should be enough for us. The ruler comes and kneels before him and says, my daughter has just died, but I believe, come and lay your hand on her and she will live. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, this ruler says. And after a delay, he comes to the ruler's house, saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, and confesses simply the truth. The girl is not dead because she is in me. And because she is in me, she is but sleeping. Well, of course, the flute players and the commo- those making the commotion, and really anyone of any kind of reasonable character would laugh at him, and they did. What a joke. The girl is dead. There's no breath in her. Just touch her and see. But not for Jesus. He puts the crowd aside. He goes in. He touches her hand. And he speaks to her. Right? He says, little girl, Talitha Kumi, arise. Or, if you prefer, resurrect. And with that word and with that breath, with that touch, the finger of God, the little girl arises. And the report went through that district. 
And that word alone should be enough for us to dispel any kind of gloom or sadness we have. That for Jesus, our death, that great enemy, that last enemy to be defeated, can be easily dispelled by a mere touch and a word from Jesus. But if that's not enough, then of course there was that interlude, the story of a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, certainly would have led ultimately to her death. And for this woman, it's enough. Her faith so compels her simply to touch the garment of Jesus, the fringe of the garment even. She believes, she confesses, if only I just touch his garment, I will be made well. And again, Jesus turns and says a word, and that word dispels whatever darkness and gloom, even that great sickness that has overwhelmed her for 12 years. It's cast aside just by a word. Take heart. Be encouraged. Your faith, your faith in me, has saved you. Made you well is too soft a translation. It saved you. You've been saved not just from that bodily illness, but from all sin, from death like the little girl, from the the powers of hell, from whatever gloom and darkness that might overwhelm you in this world, it's been taken away simply by your faith and trust in me and that word, you're saved. Or, if you prefer, I forgive you. That should be enough for us. (laughs) Jesus has such power over the dead, over those whose sin is so rampant that they have illness leading to death. If he could do it for them by a mere word, he can do it for us, again, by a mere word. But the prophet Isaiah had something even bigger in mind. (laughs) Let's not forget who Jesus is. Jesus is, as St. John confesses, the word of God who tabernacles among us, who takes up flesh among us. He is the Word made flesh, the very Word of God, not just a a man walking, speaking, but the Word that made all things and that created all things, that set all things in order, even the multitude of the planets and the stars, even the motion of the earth, even set the sun on fire, and put the moon in orbit to give us light by night. He causes the seed to sprout. He causes the rain to fall. He causes the day to rise and the sun to set. The seasons and the days are all signs of his ongoing regular providence for us, his care for us. But if that weren't enough, that's pretty big picture, right? He would have us not only remember the creation of all things and indeed the way that he even knit you together, created you by a breath as a knitter in your mother's womb, but he would have you remember all of his great and mighty deeds. This is the reason why we never fail. (laughs) We take the time, as tedious and laborious as it might seem to be, to read the whole history of God's people, to read from Moses, to read from the prophets and the kings. To read how God, on his, of his ongoing and regular care for his people, and I think the key detail is even when they rebel against him, leave the light of his mercy and grace and return again to the darkness of sin, death, of idolatry, of rebellion, just as our first parents did. Was it not You, God, who cut Rahab in in pieces and who pierced the dragon. Was it not you who dried up the Red Sea, the, the sea, and made the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed, those exiles leaving Egypt for the promised land to walk over, to pass over? Was it not you who fed the people miraculously with manna and quail in the wilderness? Was it not you who 
destroyed the enemies as the people of God went into the promised land? Was it not you, O commander of the Lord's hosts, of the, the angel of the Lord, who led Joshua and the people into that conquest? Was it not you that brought your people into Zion to sing, to rejoice? But of course, as Isaiah reminds us, sometimes, maybe too often, we prefer to live in the darkness rather than in the light. I am he who comforts you, and yet you are afraid not encouraged, but afraid of man who dies, of son of man who is made like the grass. Why are you afraid of this world, of its leaders, of its tyrants, of earthly enemies? Have you forgotten, Isaiah reminds us, the Lord, your maker? Again, the one who stretched out the heavens, who laid the foundations of the earth? You have forgotten, for you fear, not the Lord, but you fear the enemies that the Lord has already conquered continually, every day, all the day. You fear their wrath, but why? Because they have already been destroyed. Where is their wrath? What can they do to you? That's Isaiah's question. And again, it's a reasonable question. Why return to the darkness? Why live in constant fear and anxiety about what this world will bring? Why live in terror over your sin when there is forgiveness for you? Why fear death when God has declared multitude of ways and through his prophets and through Christ himself the resurrection of the body and life everlasting? Instead, confess as Isaiah confessed. He who is bowed down shall speedily be released. Yes, you may suffer for a day, but you will rejoice with gladness into eternity. You shall not die and go down to the pit, neither will your bread be lacking, but you will be resurrected from the pit and to feast in heaven on the bread of heaven into eternity. Don't believe me? <laughs> well, listen again. I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is my name. And that is the reason why I have put my words in your mouth. That's why I've gathered you around the, the very gifts that I've instituted. Because it is through your baptism that you were clothed with Jesus. You have more than just the hem of his garment to touch, but rather you have been enshrouded in Christ himself. You have his healing touch with you every day. He has covered you with the shadow of his, of his hand, protecting you from all the forces that would drag you back into the darkness of this world. And again, don't believe him? Well, he established the heavens. He laid the foundations of the earth. And just as he said to the little girl, Talitha Kumi, I say to you, arise, or to that woman, your faith has saved you, your faith in me. So he has said to you by your baptism, you are my Zion, you are my chosen people. Come, be comforted, be encouraged, be steadfast, and you will inherit everything I have promised you. May God grant it in the name of Jesus. Amen.